Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's panel moderator, Julia Henkels, North American Head of Digital Health for Ipsos Advisory Services. Julia, you have the floor. Hello and welcome to our panel discussion. I am Julia, the head of North America Digital Health at Ipsos, and we are thrilled to be joined by our panel of digital health thought leaders. Um, Xuan Gui is the head of global digital strategy at Bristol Myers Squibb. Melinda Decker is the chief commercial officer of MyMe, and Owen McCarthy is the president and co-founder of MedRhythms. Xuan, Melinda, and Owen, great to see you. Thank you for joining. Uh, shall we go around the table and do introductions? Xuan, uh, if you'd like to start. Sure. Um, thank you very much for inviting us. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, really excited to be on this panel with these esteemed um, guests that you have invited who are also good friends that I've known for a while. So uh, really, really good to be here. Uh, Xuan Gui, I head up Global Digital Strategy at Bristol-Myers Squibb. Uh, I work across the enterprise, um, everything from R&D, global drug development, commercial, all the way through uh, supply chain and manufacturing to really understand what the business challenges and needs are and to then uh, look for the right type of external digital partners uh, who may have solutions that help us transform our business. And so that's really what uh, I focus on at BMS. Thank you. Melinda? Uh, good afternoon, or yeah, I guess it's good morning, good afternoon, depending upon where you are in the country. Um, I am Melinda Decker. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer of MyMe. Um, MyMe is a digital care company that focuses on autoimmune disease and identifying triggers, diet and environmental triggers. So, for example, food, stress, um, and it's done through a mobile app, data analytics, and health coach investigators. So we have real humans involved, and we'll get to some of that in a bit, um, but identifying those food and environmental triggers and then helping sustain behavior change. Um, and we offer our program uh, direct to consumers, um, so individuals can go sign up, as well as through large self-insured employers and payers. Fantastic. Thanks, Melinda. And Owen? Great, thanks, Julia, and really great to be here with all of you and with our with our esteemed panelists, as Schwen, Schwen would say. Um, my name is Owen McCarthy. I'm the co-founder and president of MedRhythms, and at Med, MedRhythms we build uh, prescription digital therapeutics that are evidence-based that use sensor software and music to measure and improve walking following neurologic injury disease. The company launched out of Spalding Rehab in Boston, where my co-founder was taking some of the science that we've digitized on how you can use rhythm to target the motor system and improve real motor function as relates to that um, live and you know, wanted to figure out a way to scale that. And so we've built a platform that takes sensor data in, measures walking biomechanics in real time, feeds that into a device, and then based on that has a digital therapeutic intervention delivered back to someone. And we're taking a very, what you might feel familiar approach to developing a pipeline where our, we have a chronic stroke asset that's the farthest along um, in pivotal trial. And we have uh, assets in feasibility in Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, FND, acute stroke, kind of down um, the area. So looking forward to engaging uh, with the panelists and hearing your questions and uh, diving in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, let's jump in. Actually, Owen, um, our, our first question, we can start with you if that's okay. Uh, so we are seeing tons of innovation in digital therapeutics and new offerings all the time. Just to kick us off, um, could you give an overview of the different types of digital therapeutics? Yeah, no, thanks, Julia. And, and as I think about sort of our level setting for this conversation, um, you know, I'd like to use the definition of what a digital therapeutic is from the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, which um, really that boils down to these are software products that are evidence-based, so goes through some sort of rigorous clinical trials, are regulated appropriately, so oftentimes go through the FDA or regulated bodies, you know, as necessary, um, that treat, manage, or prevent disease. So they're not sort of wellness app on App Store, you know, there's hundred thousands of them, you know, and, and, you know, they come in different sort of flavors, you know, right? Some of them are standalone interventions, you know, for example, 
a Killy Interactive, a video game to treat, you know, cognitive centers in children for ADHD is, is a standalone intervention. Others are companions that are very complementary to pharmaceuticals or, you know, other types of interventions. Um, and then others, you know, fit into things like digital care, like at uh, MIMI, and, and they kind of they kind of fit together. Um, and then, you know, I think Melinda maybe can dive more into this, but there's there's a different market approaches, whether it's prescription or over the counter or others that are really determined based on the market that you're going after. But I think I'll stop there um, for, you know, how we think about defining and thinking about digital therapeutics. So I'll just jump in and say, so Miami is a perfect example of, you know, a digital care, some say self-care, there's lots of different definitions that come up of what type of digital health company we are. Um, but looking at identifying and improving the symptoms, we, we do run clinical trials, we do um, collect real world evidence, we do collect patient reported outcomes in order to demonstrate improvement. So very much evidence-based. Um, but we are currently over the counter. Um, so we are, you know, not regulated as a prescription. Um, and so making sure that we stay in that um, appropriate way. So we're not treating disease, for example. Um, we are not in that space currently. Um, and so it's a little bit different in, in what you're looking at and then the market you can go to. So a lot of the digital health companies that have been able to market direct to consumer initially um, sometimes fall into this space, either that they are through digital care or they're a different definition than a prescription digital therapeutic. So, um, you know, Owen mentioned his own company, um, Achilles Endeavor, um, Click Therapeutics, uh, CT152, the partnership with Otsuka. These are all for depression. Um, so those are all examples of prescription digital therapeutics, which are a little bit different than um, some of the, you know, Livongo, Amada type of diabetes prevention um, types of solutions, which sometimes could be digital care. And we also talk about the human element, um, and we'll get to that more later, but the human element sometimes drives some of your cost of goods if you have coaches or other healthcare professionals involved in the process. So we'll get, we'll get to that as we go. And if I could add on sort of the, the pharma industry point of view, I think, you know, in general, we, we tend to align with this digital therapeutic alliance definitions uh, as far as the buckets are concerned. And, and Owen, you know, went into detail on what each one of those are. Uh, I think one important uh, factor to think about is when you think about where the difference is between this and what else we do uh, in, in traditional pharma and digital in the pharma industry, um, it, this is really focused on software as a medical device. That's really the category that we're focused on here. But in terms of um, how we think about digital therapeutics and digital medicines, I think we also have to consider that um, some companies are looking at standalone applications that Owen mentioned, and therefore more of that prescription digital therapeutic site where the digital platform is the treatment and the therapeutic that's actually going to be addressing the condition. And then on the other hand, because pharma companies are really much more uh, you know, focused, I mean, their, their whole process and their whole company is designed to really develop traditional chemical compounds, right, uh, traditional assets. Um, so then there's also what uh, Owen referred to as digital companions, which may supplement and enhance the uh, outcomes that are driven by the traditional sort of chemical compound. So I think that's the the big difference um, that that um, I wanted to, oh, not big difference, really. The, the point of view from a pharma standpoint of other considerations when we think about this space. Yeah, and one area that I didn't touch on that I meant to was I do think, you know, the lion's share of the initial applications of digital therapeutics or, you know, this mashup of digital care, digital therapeutics have been in behavior change modification. Um, and it's been really targeting different mental health diseases or different areas where behavior change can make a big difference. You know, some of the ones that I would think are more standalone or others that are coming along really are taking advantage of other stimuli. So sound in our case, you know, uh, video games, other things to target parts of the brain to change function in brain to have some sort of, you know, some sort of neurological change. And those ones, you know, are sort of the a, a new frontier coming up. And I think that, um, you know, in that case, um, you know, you, you're going to see a whole flavor of new products, um, you know, in, the, in those spaces in the next three to five years. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
So moving on from there, yeah, our, our title is, is getting into these partnerships. Um, perhaps, Schwen, if you wanted to start off, I know you, know, you are the co-founder of Novartis Biome um, and you know, Melinda as well, like a, um, a bunch of leadership roles in, in, uh, in pharma, forming these partnerships between digital therapeutics companies um, and biopharma. Could you speak to what are the different kinds of models for partnering and what are the considerations for each? You know, I'll, I'll start off by kind of talking about the partnering space as a whole when it comes to pharma and um, startups in general, right? With, you know, health tech startups. I think in, in the past, at least, uh, most biopharma companies are very well set up for more traditional uh, partnerships and contracting with more of the big vendors, right? The Fortune 500, the one that are really big can scale with the company and support all the needs uh, in traditional sort of uh, pharma um, process. Uh, however, when it comes to startups, a lot of times they're much smaller, they're much more nimble. They may not even have a general counsel in-house uh, and, and they're much more risky because a lot of times they're not, they don't have the same type of proof of ability to deliver like some of the big companies and if you look at their bank account, sometimes they're not even very well funded, right? So there's always that that risk. And so when it comes to partnering with startups, uh, digital startups or health tech startups as a whole, um, if, if you apply the same level of risk assessment to them as you do with a Fortune 500 company, you will not be able to work with any of them to an extent, or you're going to be applying the same type of one size fits all uh, methodology to companies that can't react in the same way because they have to contract with an external legal counsel to review the contract and you give them the same 150 page contract that takes them nine months, they may have run out of money by that point and therefore you'll have nobody to work with. So, uh, you know, we have to really start to think about how we're adapting our internal processes and ways of working to these kinds of companies. I think that's one really important point with just working with health tech startups in general. Um, the other side of things is really just understanding um, the language we're using and the types of um, definitions that we're de uh, trying to establish as the role for the digital medicine, digital therapeutic company versus what's the role that internally a pharma company should play. So uh, there, you know, who's going to be the legal manufacturer of the product, which brings a lot of responsibility in terms of once you launch and, and, and you know, whose name is on the product or whether you can make a, play, uh, a claim or not, uh, or are you just a sponsor? And in which case, then you're limited to what you can do. So there's roles and responsibilities and definitions that you really have to work through that will really help with the relationship and help define what is each person's uh, responsibility and what you can do uh, once you go forward with that partnership. Well, and Schwen, just to, just to jump in there a minute, I, I think there's so many different partnerships that exist. You know, um, Julia mentioned the Novartis Biome, um, you know, J-Labs has theirs, there's incubators. Uh, Miami is a J-Labs company and, and has worked at other incubators. So there's partnerships in that sense. Um, but there's also different partnerships. Um, some of the uh, Japanese pharmaceutical companies have really been cutting edge in some of their partnerships with, with um, you know, digital health, digital therapeutics. And some of them have more traditional BD relationships or, you know, product and tech on one side and commercialization, but some aren't. Um, I know Schwen BMS just uh, did a deal recently as well on the digital therapeutics. So there's off, often ways of how um, people can commercialize or what the partnerships can look like if they're providing funding, if they're providing some kind of other resources. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that that pharma has gone about. Some of it's through the venture arm and then providing some resources. So um, most of the big companies have, have a venture arm that does some strategic investments. Um, ways that pharma does partner in the digital health ecosystem, including non-digital therapeutic things like R&D and, and whatnot, um, but some really great, great things happening. Yeah, and from the, you know, from our perspective, we're seeing it. You, we, in some organizations, every part of the organization is looking at a different kind of partnership. So, you know, if you're in the mm -hmm. audience from a, you know, different part of a pharma company, you know, if you're in like some deals that are done, look like co-development through milestones and commercialization on the other side. And those seem to be on products um, that are taking approaches that seem similar to pharma in terms of commercial a little bit, um, you know, and, and there's some com companies that are doing uh, deals on the commercial side of the business that 
you know, whether it be um, a good way to add extra data into, you know, their, their molecules or, or have a better relationship with the patient or treat a symptom that's really, you know, kind of connecting to that, that uh, molecule. Like there is a lot of different, um, you know, things going on and we'll mention a few of them later on, but um, you know, and then as Melinda said, I don't know, I was just doing uh, some, you know, pulling together a PowerPoint the other day that I think there was like six or seven, either pharma funds or pharma funds were the sole LP pharma was the sole LP in said fund that had done deals in digital therapeutics. Um, Okay. Um, And, and moving on um, when you are developing, you know, in inside of pharma, um, one of these digital therapeutics, um, you know, well, developing, launching, and and commercializing um, compared to pharmaceutical. Um, if we compared and contrasted those two, um, what what is different? How do things need to be to be different in in response? So I'll Actually, jump in just, just to say on product, for example, the way you iterate on product and what you launch with, right? Oftentimes you're not you're not doing a you know a beta version that you launch with. It's somewhere more advanced. But the fact that it iterates in very very quick cycles, um, I give the the um, example. I worked on Enbrel for many years. Fantastic product. I'm a biochemical engineer. I love love the biologic medications. And um, but you know it was years to go from you know a lyophilized powder formulation to a sub you know to the uh, pre-filled syringe and then eventually to an auto injector. That iterate would probably happen in a year or two in the digital side. Um, And so understanding that as well as what evidence will occur along the way and what UX improvements need to happen and which CX, like a process for feedback. Um, So I think there's some organizational capabilities that are different. There's also differences with which aspect of the FDA that you're working with. So usually the established relationship that um, the company has is, is not with the same part of the FDA. Um, and so there's some things like that that are that are very, very different. Um, but having those people in-house, um, AstraZeneca, for example, has a, has a team of UXX, which is not a capability that was needed before all of this happened, you know, aside from maybe some commercial little apps and some some other things, but it is core to the business of digital therapeutics. So you have to have experts on that. Yeah, I'll add on that, um, you know, with with pharma companies, um, you know, the, the entire uh, industry has been built on the ability to deliver on developing and manufacturing uh, traditional drugs. So we're very used to that. Uh, traditional development of prescription drugs type approach, right? You know, whether it's, um, uh, yeah, you start with target validation, you go through the phase one through three, and then you you get it approved and you go to market. That's kind of a process that we're very used to. Um, and then as a company, as, as technology has advanced and as the company has started to enable a lot of these processes through technology, we've also learned to start to really have a very good uh, software development lifecycle or SDLC. So we know how to manage and maintain our software platforms that help enable the work that we do. Um, however, when it comes to digital medicines and digital therapeutics, I think it follows a slightly different pathway that is a neither one or the other, and it's a combination of both. And it really is much more about that software as a medical device pathway. Uh, much of it is what Melinda was talking about. It re- you know, it, it's much more aligned with CDRH rather than CDR, which is a traditional sort of RX type of approach. And it's also um, most like most aligned with probably something that's a medical device or a diagnostic kind of approach rather than a RX or a, a SDLC approach. And so there are unique characteristics, unique regulations, unique um, uh, ways of working within digital therapeutics, which are not common to the way we've always worked in pharma, whether it's in the technology end or the um, you know traditional asset end. And so those are some of the things that we have to start to learn and adjust to. Uh, and especially when we launch one of these products, you know, there's a whole level of product team support that you need to bring uh, to maintaining these as well. It's not, it's not um, the same as um, how we've always done it. Though, you know, I will add when you, and we'll probably get into business models in a minute that my comment depends on the business model. So if we think about the prescription route, you know, which is, we do a lot. um, When you get to the commercial side of the or the you know, business, like business, the products are used in home largely, 
almost like a, like a pharmaceutical product. Most medical devices are implanted in a hospital. So like business models look more like pharmaceutical in a sense there, you know, there's movement on getting them paid for by third party payers. Um, and so that's, that's positive. Um, and, you know, you sort of have to drive demand from doctors to write prescriptions for someone to use it in home. So they're, you know, while the earlier fa phase of the organization looks more like med device, the latter stage looks more like, you know, pharma in a sense. And, you know, and this is one of the questions why I've asked myself, if you look at the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, why aren't there more medical device companies that are members mm -hmm. versus like there's a bunch of the pharma companies that are members. And I think it's because when you get to commercial and then the data generated, like there's, there's something that clicks in people's mind that says, oh, interesting. I could see how this works, even though there's a bunch of things that we need to change about how we operate to do that. Mm. Ah, perfect, perfect segue, Owen. Before we get into uh, the uh, showing value-based solutions and, and patient outcomes and, and the business model, can we talk for a second about about the the internal organization. So, you know, Shwen and Melinda, as you said, it's it's so different than the way that pharma has been run in the past. Um, how how should we be integrating these, you know, the digital therapeutics into pharma and how do you need to be set up internally to, to bring this, you know, from, from development to commercialization? So, and do you want to I mean, start? That's a million, yeah, that's like the million dollar question. I don't think any one company has figured that out yet. Uh, I think in some cases it starts in R&D. Uh, in other cases, it's in development. And in most cases, I think it actually sits somewhere between commercial and BD. Um, and, and every company is slightly different depending on what they're doing. Sometimes it's in multiple areas. And so um, it really depends on um, the, the strategic approach that each company is taking. But I would say that, you know, uh, for something to be truly effective, it probably needs to be earlier on in the life cycle, um, uh, pre-approval sort of uh, to, to really understand how it fits into a therapeutic area or a, or a uh, particular indication and uh, be integrated into how it's going to work with the rest of the plan for that particular indication. So it becomes a, a real enhancement uh, to drive outcomes for the patient at the end of the at the end of the day so um you know wherever that belongs i think there needs to be a team associated with it and it needs to follow through from the early development stages of the life cycle all the way through to post-marketing well and just to add in there i think this is um i love owen and his it depends on the model statement but i think that's a lot of it is is it a prescription digital therapeutic is it a standalone mm -hmm. is it something that's being used to collect data or insights for the product is it something that's being used to, to manage adverse events? So it's a you know, complement to the medication to, for example, uh, treat hypertension, right? That might be a side effect, right? Or um, the you know, immune-mediated adverse events of some of the immunology agents. Like what's the purpose of it, right? So Voluntis is a, another digital therapeutics company that has some partnerships in the oncology space. You know, is it to improve adherence? Is it tied to one therapeutic area? Right. So is it to differentiate and demonstrate leadership for pharma overall? Right. So just some questions that come. So if it happens to be more of a patient support that's for the entire, you know, uh, entire therapeutic area, like behavior change in the diabetes and cardiovascular, for example, that's very, very different than a standalone product, um, right. you know, that would be licensed in. So so uh, it's so nuanced, but um, but it's important to think about some of those differences. Yes. Um, and so, yes, now now uh, shifting toward our, our patient outcomes and, and business models, um, you know, a lot of clients that that we talk to in, in the digital health and digital therapeutic space um, are wanting to get to these proven outcomes for the patient. And uh, Melinda and I were just talking about the other day about how much this has changed, like even over the past few years, you know, at the, the Digital Therapeutics Alliance meetings, uh, checking, you know, who's who's doing what and what's working. Um, so maybe Melinda, if you if you want to start um, with the, you know, moving to value-based care, how do you generate patient proven outcomes? 
so so almost all of these products have you know have evidence which is what owen kicked off with so usually through rcts especially the prescription digital therapeutics because they had to have those you know they did an fda pre-submission and then they ran trials and then they you know got approved or cleared by the fda right so it comes through this process um, so there's rigorous evidence However, that's usually not where it ends. And there's, you know, real world evidence, even on the pharma side of things has had a dramatic uptake in the past few years. And so demonstrating how this works in the real world, if you can associate it with reduction in claims data for healthcare utilization, for example, right, you can see that surgeries were avoided, some of the musculoskeletal digital therapeutics. So, you know, Hinge and, and Kaya, for example, looking at surgeries avoided or physical therapy avoided, how can you have savings? So there's actually claims data from real world evidence. There's things like patient reported outcomes. So at, at Miami, we collect baseline. We have a validated PROs. We collect it baseline at the end of our about four month program. And then we show they're sustained at a year. So it's tremendous to say people not like we save money and you feel better because some of those pieces are what you need to show to payers, such as self-insured employers or other you know large insurance companies to get coverage. Right. So. Dollars, it justifies and improve outcomes, it justifies the expense to get on formularies. So there's lots of different ways to do it, but I think it's very, very common that that is the ask. That is certainly the ask to get on digital health formularies, a combination of RCTs and real world evidence. So even once you get clearance as a as the prescription digital therapeutics, people are then still having to do you know the equivalent of phase four studies or real world evidence studies to improve their value dossiers, just as you would think about, you know, with some of the more traditional um, pharmaceutical products. Yeah, and a lot of that is depends, I think, on, you know, what, when someone's like, well, what's the right model for this digital therapeutic in this space when they get asked that question, right? You know, to me, I my first thing I think about is like, well, who's the payer mix, right? Like, like, and what what do they care about? Because ultimately, as, well, assuming that you're not going to have a consumer pay out of pocket for it, which some people do, and then some people are successful in that. But assuming you want a third party payer, you know, the the people who have been the most advanced have been the employers in the, the last four or five years um, because in their equation may be slightly different in the fact that, you know, they want people, they want people to stay at the job. They want them to work more. They, they want a satisfaction. Plus they want these health outcomes, plus, you know, so across the board. And so if you look at the, the first set of products that have gotten to scale, Melinda sort of hinted at them. You look at like musculoskeletal disease, like things that, you know, keep people from having surgeries, things that treat chronic pain, you know, that mashup, you know, there's, there's hundred million dollars plus or more revenue companies valued at more than a billion dollars, you know, in that space right now. And like the pandemic's been very good for driving more and more demand there. Um, and then if you look at the, but now if you kind of go back to um, the third party payers that aren't employers, so the Medicare's, the Medicare Advantage, the Medicaid's, they're a little behind. I mean, the industry is only five to 10 years old. And so to get coverage, you know, there's a number of things that have to happen, including like a benefit category that you fit under um, within the legal statutes of those plan designs. And, you know, software only products have had a hard time getting benefit categories and those are changing and they've recognized it's a problem and AdvaMed's lobbying for it. And there's some legislation for that. So like, it's a matter of, you know, we would like to think a couple of years before when that gets sorted out, but, you know, that's sort of still its infancy, you know, products that do have hardware, like, you know, you look at Free Spira, which has a product that treats panic attack disorder, has found a way to get paid for under medical benefit, um, you know, like, like you would for a lot of medical products, you know, they're, they're using, I believe, some form of the code set there, you know, similar to J code, but not exactly, but like that same, that same line and um, expect those to come along. And then, um, you yeah, know, I don't want to steal Melinda's thunder about the remote patient monitoring, but there's some products that the services provided get paid for under CPT codes. But Melinda, what did you say? Like that still doesn't pay for product. Um, right. Yeah. I, I was still trying to figure out how I'm going to get paid. Like that's great yeah. that the rheumatologist yeah. who's looking at the data or the dermatologist or gastro, I'm yeah. thrilled that they're getting paid, but I still haven't gotten paid, which is the important piece to run a business is you yeah. still got to get paid. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, I, and I think that's 
the CBT codes are a great example because some of them even have rules about, for example, you have to have a first session with a therapist or a coach in person before then it later reimburses, right? Well, if you're fully remote, which most of the digital therapeutic solutions are, your first you know, call with a coach or with any kind of HCP or anything else that's happening is remote. So you don't fit nicely into this little bucket that was defined before. Yeah, I think what's obvious when I hear, you know, yourself, Melinda and Owen, um, you speak about this. I mean, to, to everyone, I think it should see, be very obvious that we're not, this isn't like the old days where we're launching a mobile app, right? Where we just basically developed something on our own to completion, did a UX test and then launched it and hope for the best. This is very rigorous and it's going through a process that's much more similar to a prescription drug than it is to a mobile app development cycle. And so we're generating all the clinical evidence that kind of shows um, the outcomes it's going to drive. And that's the ability then to be able to get claims and reimbursement and so on. So it's thought a lot more like the way we bring our drug to market. But I think, you know, um, it, 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 it's one of those things where we really need to think about this differently because um, it, it, it's not it's not the same as just launching a, a digital product, right? And and so um, that I, I think this is just uh, something that we need to highlight. Well, one thing just to add in is even just pricing, right? How do you determine pricing? And so we we know how to do pricing analysis and price sensitivity and elasticity and value dossiers even across the globe, right? And figuring out nice yeah. and other places. And it's not as clear yet in digital therapeutics, including the fact, you know, um, Owen gave some examples of where things initially started, right, in musculoskeletal, in, in mental health, um, you know, ADHD, a lot of the CNS categories. But looking at some other things, you know, oncology, autoimmune disease, where, you know, rare diseases where pharmaceutical products maybe are, are priced at 100000 or a $1 million dollars or you know, if you could get similar outcomes, could you also charge a million dollars for a digital therapeutic, right? We haven't seen that yet. Um, and so, you know, and value-based care has been, I always say it's been coming in the pharmaceutical industry for like 20 years. Um, and still we do a lot of fee for service. Um, and so it's a different place to say, are we actually getting paid off outcomes? Um, and so we're, we're going there, but to see what the pricing would be. So I'll, I'll pause that. I know you have more questions, Julia, but it's just Caught. Yeah, we could talk here all day. I was just going to add one more piece, which is, you know, especially because you asked about value based care. Um, I think, you know, uh, as we start to move into that world where we're going to need to pro provide evidence for the value of our products, uh, especially the prescription drugs that we, um, we, we we manufacture, and especially in a space which may be crowded with other competitors, how do we differentiate ourselves and how do we show the value we bring? Uh, it's almost going to be um, even more critical for us to have a digital companion for every traditional prescription drug we have in order to collect the data at a much higher resolution than just claims data or EHR data because we're getting much more information and data that we can mine for insights on whether we're actually making a change for that particular patient. Uh, and, and with all that data being collected in a consistent way and with all the evidence that has been generated to show what type of uh, outcomes it can drive, you may even be able to then start to move down the road towards much more um, uh, stratified approaches, much more personalized delivery of care and, medi and, and even medication. Uh, and and, and ultimately yield things like uh, algorithms for uh, predictive analytics, using predictive analytics to then have, um, you know, digital biomarkers that you're able to leverage to then segment the type of patient that should be on a particular type of drug or a, uh, a version of the digital platform that uh, guides them uh, through a different type of pathway. No, sure. I mean, that's, I mean, that's super interesting. I mean, I know, we always say, given our mission and who we are, we're intervention first. Like we want to like treat patient first, though we get 40 biomechanical data points for every step of a person <laughs> that happens on the intervention. And like, you know, if you look at uh, the, the, the neurodegenerative diseases we're going after, you can learn a whole lot about how they're walking, about that condition based on how they're walking in the moment and over time. And so, you know, we get super excited about that. But if we were to say partner with someone, we'd want them to be committed to intervention first and not want just like us to send them a bunch of data. Um, so, you know, but that's just our perspective. I know others have a different perspective on that. I think a lot of people want to partner with digital pharma companies want to partner with digital health to be a diagnostic to help run clinical trials better. Right. So I'm with you, Owen, that it's, you know, I absolutely see the pharma perspective, but I see ours is we're trying to improve patient outcomes directly. But the insights that you capture 
you know, Schwen summed it up nicely on, on what you can do with that. It's, it is very interesting though, to see because partnering with, with pharma has sometimes different goals. And so you have to make sure you're aligned that you're both looking towards the same thing. The one thing, the analogy I always like to give though, is for those of you who've worked in specialty care for a while, and I know there's a lot of us, um, there was a time when field reimbursement managers weren't typical right now you couldn't launch without having that team right you know there was a time when copay cards weren't normal for most of the products right there's those types of things that had to happen even having nurses come into your home to help demonstrate sub q injections like they're designed to be at home right and that's the level of patient support that products will have over time and some of those will be digital therapeutics as companions to products and that will just be the new playing field of it doesn't have a behavior change component with it. It doesn't have a mental health anxiety, like a Sanofi um, and Happify, a mental health component for MS, right? How could you launch a product without that? That's what uh, target product profiles, including digital components down the road. So it becomes mm -hmm. the new standard of care and just the cost of entry in the future. That's that's the goal uh, for sure. Shwen, uh, what you what you brought up, I think, also highlights. You know, given your maybe you know being in charge of the globe is 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 part of this and 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 getting to that long term vision. But um, I think it shows the complementarity of biopharma and a lot of these digital therapeutics companies because you have Owen who's generating you know terabytes of data with every few steps you know with with all of the patients. Um, but then you know in biopharma like you you. Um, Maybe you have uh, an on-prem or you know cloud service where you can have a team and and you can process those data and you can you know Owen's not thinking about <laughs> incorporating genomic, proteomic, and epigenetic data sets right now you know it, into into the the model like yes we'll get there or we'll not uh, you know not uh, not too quickly in a strategic way um, but then you know all all the more reason why. Um, biopharma with with the the resources, the scale, the size, the the know how, uh, why the the partnerships uh, are so uh, beneficial to both parties. Um, yeah, absolutely, so, Julia. You bring up oh, a great point. I mean, I think you know, getting data from one source is great uh, at the resolution that this can collect. But when you combine it with multimodal data to really understand how to stratify patients in a way that could influence. Uh, discovery and development for specific uh, segments, um, that could be super powerful because you can kind of figure out, you know, who are the uh, going to be the best responders, who are actually going to need a different type of uh, treatment or care, uh, care plan, um, and so on. So, so it becomes, like I said, I think it's driving towards really um, much more of that personalized medicine approach as we are able to understand how different populations differ from each other. Agreed. I'm, I'm a little biased here from one point. You know, I think that, you know, we, we've done some interviews of a bunch of patients and we ask them that, you know, there's a and I, there's a number of monitoring solutions, say an MS, right? That like either companies have like track your symptoms, track your feelings, et cetera. And, you know, and we've said, well, why are you using these? Why aren't you using these? And they're like, well, like, I don't know how it benefits me. Right. You know, like the, the digital therapeutic, like is designed initially to immediately have a benefit to something about their lives. And as a result of that, you build a relationship, you know, whether, you know, with a, with a software product that then they're more willing to give up data is a hypothesis I have right now. Um, and I think it could be played out over time. Um, well, it's, it's the piece that we, say, that we say at MIME because identifying your triggers is one piece, but actually making the behavior change, right? Like, and I use always in diabetes, like everyone knows we should be eating healthier and right. exercise more, right? But we don't do it always right and so so you know identifying the triggers is extremely difficult unique triggers for each individual totally personalized right for autoimmune disease but then once you do that how do you actually get people to continue that behavior change right and so that's when for us we have seen such tremendous benefit of having actual humans wonderful phenomenal coaching staff right so certified health coaches and health investigators who help motivate you to continue on that path right so there's that component as well well, and there was, I was talking to you guys about this yesterday, but Wobot just published a study that their yeah. relational agent, which is all sort of AI based, not human based, and is often used between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. to work on things like depression, as I understand it. Um, 
they published a study that said that they could build a faster relationship with a software product with patient because I think they said I was meeting their needs. I, I'm, you should look up the study to get the exact words right. But, you know, then a human clinician potentially could. And, and you know, it's really interesting to think about, you know, as we talk about this being table stakes for treating patients, like, like you're going to have like the front door to a patient potentially be digital therapeutics uh, into the future. Yeah, and congrats to our friends there who recently got breakthrough designation, right? Correct, correct. For postpartum depression, I think was the indication, mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Well, and, and one example, and I may have shared with uh, Schwen and Owen before, but one example I always give is like cutting edge technology um, People often ask us when we have sessions with our coaches at Miami, when the uh, individual has a session, why we don't use video camera, right? They're like, do you have that capability? And we actually tried it at some point years ago, right? We tested it and we found that people are less honest. They're performing when they're on camera and we need them to actually tell us the truth of how, what your symptoms are and what you've eaten, right? You can't like hide the fact that you, you know, were eating, you know, something you shouldn't, you know, you might be a trigger, right? You're eating tons of corn and you didn't tell us you were eating tons of corn, right? So we need to know. And so we actually found that people are more honest on just a telephone call, which I've actually used out of myself to hold more meetings where I'm like walking and talking and in those types of things with people. But because you're like always on video, you know, you have this little way of being different than your real self. So we well, should turn it is off for the, for the rest of the panel so we can give you the rest of the screen. <laughs> Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, it, it, just a few years ago, there was actually some studies done, uh, especially when chat bots and voice bots were getting really hot, uh, which showed that actually there's uh, there's a segment of, of people that uh, are, are probably a younger audience that prefers to actually uh, engage with a chat bot because they don't feel as judged as when they talk to a person, right? And so they actually prefer that kind of engagement uh, versus a, a traditional like consult. Uh, with a with a human, um, and therefore I think that the, the study that uh, Wobot did and, and the result that they got is not surprising because um, these types of um, uh, engagement platforms have become really sophisticated, and also through the you know by driving uh, through M AI and ML, um, you're getting much more personalized responses and so on, which is really the basis of a lot of uh, digital therapeutics as well. Mm, yes. Um, and I think what, what's crystallizing for me in, in just, you know, this past couple of minutes of, of conversation is the sort of strategic timeline where at the beginning and, you know, just where we are right now as an industry, you know, it would be fun to, you know, jump in a time machine and, and go 50 years after more data sets are knit together and maybe there's been some more consolidation Um of course, you know, here, here's where we are now. Um, but, you know, when, when you are talking to healthcare providers, when you're, when you're talking to patients, it really is all about that, like, immediate high quality service, as you were saying, oh, and like, what, what are you doing for me right now? And, and this is, this is what both patients and doctors engage with. And, you know, they'll say, you know, speaking to, PCPs, you know, um, not just off the record, on the record. I don't want another ping. Like, no, no one wants um, more like flashing screens at them. It's really all about okay, how do you add data right now? And that's that's where they are. That's that's what it takes. And then you know, you get to a more long-term vision like uh like Schwen and well all, all of you are familiar with and and have been doing where it um once you gain that that trust once you get the number of users that then you can start to knit together um different data sets get you know um more more data gives uh, allows you to formulate better algorithms which then allows you to provide additional and and better services which then you know will leads to more users so this whole this whole virtuous cycle um you know which for now i think we're we're towards the beginning of um as as an industry so um Julia, before you leave that, just just a comment. We talked about different business models earlier. That's one of the pros of also going direct to consumer over the counter initially, is you can test and iterate and do some of that in a different way with a different volume. Um, for those of you who've heard, you know, the Noom team talk before, you know, one of the things they're always testing, and I've, I've enjoyed some of those talks, 
but using it with with Miami, we've been able to iterate. And the contracts with B2B you know, partners are years in the making, right? So you're always what you've agreed to in the contract is whatever your technology was a year and a half ago when you put together the SOW. But you can actually tweak on the consumer side. Like today, let's test something new. What if we jump this step? What if we change the app? What if we give these people? And you get tremendous learnings on the direct-to-consumer side over the counter which most digital therapeutics have gone more of the prescription digital therapeutic route lately. So you can't do as much of that testing. And so, you know, you're confined to the RCTs and what you have. So it's been a benefit in, in, in my opinion, to be able to do that and iterate and, you know, learn what is the frequency we want? What do, when do people want to be pinged? When, you know, what type of type of data should we collect? Right. What will people do? So just a little, a little. Yeah. Business model. I mean, it's definitely, a big advantage in that sense, you know, you can build, you can kind of, you don't pour the foundation of the house before you know what the house is going to look like a little bit, you know, it's sort of uh, analogy, you know, in our case, so we have some angst about that, right? Go in the route that we're going, um, you know, so we've created a mechanism, what we, which we call product lab, which is, is a under IRB clinical study that's, you know, really evaluates each protocol, but more flexibly than if it was a large RCT where we can um, sort of test and iterate. And as long as we're not creating new questions of safety um, as it relates to said product lab, we can do a number of those things. Melinda's talking about save the like contract with the employer. You know, we're not doing that, but at least on the user side, you can do some of that under a mechanism like that. Great example. Yeah. Well, let's let's uh, let's run with that uh, natural segue back to you, Owen, um, on the different kinds of, of business models. What what you're seeing right now? I know, really, for for all of the panelists, it would take forever to list all of the companies that you are currently advising, serving on the boards of. You know, there's a huge wealth of um, experience, really, across all indication areas. Uh, but Owen, if you want to kick us off, what are what are some of the, the business models that we're seeing right now in uh, digital therapeutics? Yeah, I covered a little bit of this. You know, if you think about like the employer model is one of them, which is, you know, a model where it's like a per member per month, usually that someone gets paid for the use of the product, or there's sometimes one off sort of negotiated business models. And those are often over the counter products. Sometimes they can take advantage of what they call digital formularies, which express scripts um, and CVS, I forget, they call it like Evernorth or something now, or it was Evernorth Express scripts, um, formerly Express. One of them, there's two of them that have digital formularies, <laughs> the three big PBMs um, that, that sort of screen it in for employers. So that's a model. The prescription model looks more like a um, per month sort of, um, you know, prescription per month, and you get paid for that prescription per month, and it usually gets authorized for a number of days. And as I said, there's challenges with benefit category design for some software only products. You know, I think, you know, Pear has been like sort of hoeing the, like the way or the path or uh, forward. And you've seen a bunch of announcements where they've sort of got some coverage and payment under that, that type of model as a prescription um, you know, authorized for a certain amount of time for a price that they, you know, it's argued based on health economic value, what it looks like. Um, so those are some of the models. Um, and then, you know, we see um, some of the, I'm, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to some of the partnerships that were like, you know, these part, these models, like on the pharma DTX side, you know, are playing out. There's a number of what's surprising actually like companies that are doing standalone work, right? Where they're, where they are, uh, you know, I think Mel Melinda is very familiar with Otsuka. Like I think they're creating a division that really focus on launching products like this. Um, Orexo licensed in a product um, from Gaia, which had like 15 clinical studies um, that is going to be um, launched um, and is launched as is in the U S as a standalone division. You can follow it on their investor reports um, and how it's, how it's going. Uh, Vicor Pharma is going to launch a digital therapeutic. Bowringer and Click are, are looking at launching. A, so, so there's a lot of people and companies that are thinking about the standalone approach right now, um, largely focused on that second business model that I talked about. But, you know, there's, there's a variety of things happening. Well, and Owen, just to chime in there, I think even when looking, you know, for example, at health insurers, right, 
you talk about, is it, you know, under CMS, right? So is it a government as a payer or is it commercial? And then within commercial, is it, you know, what type of plan, like through something, you know, we have the self-insured employer route we talked about, but also like the individuals, you know, the exchange, the uh, Affordable Care Act, right? That's a very different, and the turnover, because I think Owen highlighted it earlier, you know, for, for a disease that is a young person impacts the working, you know, your work productivity, those types of things. That's a ideal market for self-insured employers. If it's largely happening to 75 year olds who are no longer in the workforce, it's going to be a hard way to get it covered in, in that sense. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But if it's people, you know, on the, on the exchange, they have very high turnover, right? Because, you know, maybe they get a job and get different health coverage or their spouse does, right. There's something that happens in their family. So they might only be on the exchange for six months or nine months. Right. And so it's a different timeline that you go about that. And then the other piece, you know, for the products that have gone um, over the counter um, and direct to consumer, figuring out what price point as well as what conditions people will pay for, right? So people are motivated to pay for things that are completely life-changing or in categories like oncology where you might die, right? People are willing to spend extra. They're also willing to spend a lot in things that are really debilitating like pain, right? But for example, a category like hypertension where you don't feel it would be a hard one to get people to pay for. And also things like diabetes, people don't, you know, they don't, they're more motivated by weight loss and looking good, feeling better, stronger than by managing their diabetes usually. So a lot of the studies that come out of who's going to pay for it, um, whereas, you know, that's when it's good to fall back on an insurance company or an employer, right, who would then pay for that because of the long-term benefits of, of getting those diseases under control. Yeah, and I think on the biopharma and, you know, there are a variety of vehicles by which uh, pharma companies are starting to uh, starting to partner with these types of digital medicines and digital therapeutics um, companies. On the one end, there's, you know, the, the pure investment end where there's an injection of a round of investment uh, for equitable returns. Uh, and then there's sort of the, the more BD type of partnerships where you're uh, doing co-development, co-commercialization, for example. And then there's also like the more, uh, you know, straightforward license which is more contractual and uh, in the commercial space, you tend to see that. Uh, but it could also be that um, in, in doing that, um, that the pharma company might just see the value of having that product in changing behavior or driving adherence to be valuable enough that it doesn't need to have uh, seek out reimbursement, right? It's, it's valuable enough that it's creating enough uh, return as a result of that outcome. Uh, to to support that particular license and pay for it uh, as a as a value add, and then on the other hand, you're also seeing um, you know even complete uh, M&A activities like Novartis acquired Amblyotech as a part of their ophthalmology franchise right now. So uh, you're seeing a full spectrum of activity on partnerships um, from one end to the other, uh, and, and also even in R and D and and uh, and development phases, uh, there are lots of partnerships there too. But, and I'll, I'll give the example, um, and I have, I have such the uh, great BMS lead on the phone, um, on, on the line, is Mybe would love to partner with a company, for example, that has <laughs> an autoimmune portfolio, a leading autoimmune portfolio, as well as one in immuno-oncology, where the adverse events could be triggering autoimmune disease, right? So an ideal where it could be a patient support, it could demonstrate leadership, so, um, but those types of things would be tremendous. Um, and that would be something that wouldn't then be reimbursed. We would be paid for the partnership through the pharma company because you've improved adherence and you've differentiated your product line and, you know, those types of things, managed a AEs, been able to improve the value dossier. It's a very, very different um, way of going about that. And so that's also a piece to, to keep in mind when people are looking at how it gets paid. And some of that, you know, I always give the example, I, I led um, diabetes digital health at AstraZeneca and diabetes, you have, your cost of goods are low. Uh, need, need to be low because of the price point. Whereas oncology, I also let oncology is very different if the product is hundreds of dollars a month versus hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with what wraparound patient support services you can provide. Like you, you couldn't provide a nurse to come to your house to help with diabetes in the same way that you could. I'll okay. ask you for a second there, Melinda, but um, I will say I'll, I'll have a think about which companies fit that profile that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, keep, keep <laughs> thinking about it.
Um, just to, to interject a, a quick follow up there. So I have to ask with this this level of expertise on the phone, you've been great about giving examples of, of who's working with who right now, but um, you know, would love to hear more of these industry examples and, and current partnerships uh, if any if any additional ones come to mind. Yeah, I mean, happy to. I mean, we we've we've got a partner, you know, to launch and and uh, commercialize our chronic stroke asset, and we're working on multiple partners as it relates to our pipeline. And so, like, we're taking a, a pretty aggressive partnership approach to because our disease is like an MS product and a chronic stroke product have some different commercial infrastructure required, even though it's based on the same mechanism of action and, and underlying technology platform. And so, um, you know, that that's us, you know, and we're, we've been, we've been looking for the partners that are intervention first and don't just want us for data is sort of, you know, as I said earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at the clock here. I know that we could talk all day. Um, you know, unfortunately, we just have a, a couple of minutes here. So just to, to wrap up, um, I, I'd love to hear a um, quick, quick response, you know, one minute. What are you most excited about in the industry that you see driving it forward toward patient-centric care? I'll, I'll start since I went last yesterday, so um, we'll, uh, we'll do it in, in a loop. So um, we talked a lot about products here that were behavior change in a sense, and which, which has been sort of the, the tip of the spear in a lot of ways in the industry. And it's a lot of the products like that save my me because I think they have some really custom and like good stuff that's, that's very good and works well. But a lot of them have been sort of copying uh, sort of, interventions that were known and digitizing them and making them more accessible, which is great. And it's a great start. But now that we've sort of figured out that this industry exists, there's there's people that are creating digital therapeutics from scratch that really think about the neuroscience of how you can use external stimuli like sound and light and, and, and other ways to access the brain to change functions. For example, Cognito Therapeutics is a company out of Cambridge that uses sound and light to activate, I think, the microglia in the brain to treat Alzheimer's disease. They've gotten some promising results in their phase two studies. Um, and, you know, we're going to see more and more things through AR, through VR that, that think like this, that really harness the brain and, and able to improve function through the brain. I get really excited about digital therapeutics from scratch and not ones that are sort of replicating other things that we knew that worked. Melinda? So, so overall to me, um, I'm in this business and was in the pharma business before because I'm focused on improving patient outcomes and there's so many unmet needs and we're tapping into those now. So there's plenty to still do. And the amazing part of these digital therapeutic solutions is how much they can improve outcomes. Um, the piece of it as well, which Owen touched on, is the accessibility by making it remote. Um, you know, I've worked in indications where specialists are five hours drive from someone to get to for their appointment. Right. And this can be in your home. It's convenient. We've all learned from the pa pandemic, but different. You know, once you have coverage, having it be accessible to so many people financially as well. Um, a lot of these oftentimes drive down the costs. So there's so many pieces of that that get me excited about improving outcomes and in improving access to this type of care. Yeah, so totally agree and aligned with both of you. I was going to say, you know, access and equity are, are two very big factors for what I'm most excited about because you're able to deliver this much easier than, you know, the, the way that we currently get treatments um, and it can be accessed from most people by most people almost anywhere uh, as long as they have the device uh, or, or platform to access it. Uh, but I think I'm even more excited also about the way that the data that we collect can really enhance and personalize the approach that we're taking for treatments for each individual. So we're going towards the end of one rather than a one size fits, fits all treatment. Um, and then the ability to then be able to start even getting to the world where we're starting to predict things and uh, know things um, are going to happen before they actually do so that we're not doing uh, sick care, but actually doing preventative care in the future.
Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we are at time, so I will just wrap by saying a huge thank you to the panelists, Schwen, Owen, Melinda. Such a pleasure, as always. Thank you so much for sharing all of these insights and, and your experience with the community. And, and thank you to everyone joining us. Um, great to have you and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone. I hope next time it's in person. <laughs> Thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>